Hey everyone, if you would like to support what I'm doing with Controversies in Church History and help me to expand its reach, please click on my anchor page and click the support button to donate. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome to Controversies in Church History. I am Derek Taylor and this is our podcast on controversial topics in the history of the church, Catholic Church. And so in this uh, bonus episode, I'm going to talk about a uh, topic uh, the Baroque, uh, the Church and the Baroque. And so what is the Baroque and why should you care? Well, let me tell you a little about where I go to Mass on Sundays. I live uh, in the Kansas City area, uh, Kansas City, Missouri, in the United States, center of the states. And the uh, parish I go to is called Guardian Angels Parish. And if you go there, it's a nice little limestone building, and decent interior in architectural terms. Uh, lovely stained glass windows. And if you go in, though, you'll see that the uh, ceiling over the high altar is painted over. It's covered blue. Yet, if you go downstairs to the parish hall beneath the church, you'll see a picture of Guardian Angels Parish from about 1932 or 1933, where it's been all done up, and it's got... Uh, uh, it's got the high altar, it's got altar rails, and that same ceiling, and it's got candles everywhere that are lit, and at the same ceiling above the uh, high altar is covered with pictures of angels that uh, are no longer there because it's been painted over. So why were they painted over? Well, if you are familiar with the term, you may have heard this term, I think it's an American term in its origins, the church uh, got recovated back in the 1960s. Recovate's a term that came up with colloquially to describe what happened when, in the wake of Vatican II, people thought they needed to update their churches, uh, and so a lot of old and beautiful things were sometimes literally tossed in the trash, statues, um, painting, stuff like this. Uh, for the, thankfully, for the most part, Guardian Angels didn't go that route. They're actually trying to uncover the paintings. We're trying to raise money to, to uncover those paintings uh, in the future. But question remains, why do it in the first place? Why paint over these beautiful paintings and beautiful images? Well, it's a complicated, complicated question. But one reason has to do with an, a style of art that goes back to the 17th century, which we call the Baroque. And this is an art form uh, that uh, has had a curious life. And as you're going to see, it's, uh, it's a reason why in the 1960s, uh, liturgists and people who were in charge of these things wanted to get rid of a lot of the nice things in churches. So what's the Baroque? So let's start out talking about this. If you don't know, this is a, uh, uh, the term Baroque, it usually gets explained this way. It goes back to at least one possible source of the word, the word barocco in Portuguese, which means imperfect pearl, or an Im irregular or imperfectly shaped pearl. In fact, this term is still used in jeweler's art, uh, in, in jewelry, uh, baroque pearl. There's also another Italian word, barocco, which was used in the Middle Ages by philosophers to describe an obstacle in logic, any sort of contorted uh, idea or, you know, convoluted uh, uh, process of thought. Eventually, over time, in the uh, 18th century, the word Baroque came to be used to describe anything irregular or bizarre or departing from established canons of good taste. And this was held by art critics from the 18th century onward until the end of the 19th and the 20th century uh, to describe the art of the 17th, early 18th century. The Baroque, you can put a date on it, runs from about 1600 to about 1750 or so give or take what type of art you're talking about. So why are we talking about an art style? Well, the reason we're talking about this is because the Baroque actually has its origins in the Catholic Church. In particular, in the Council of Trent. You recall, you had the Protestant Reformation in the 1520s, Martin Luther and other reform, Protestant reformers broke with the church. And the Council of Trent was called decades later to try to respond to this crisis in the Catholic Church. And one of the things they wanted to do was make sure the ordinary faithful understood the doctrines the church taught better. And so they passed uh, in the um, 
the uh, documents of Council of Trent, they issued decrees where they actually um, gave guidelines for what type of art was supposed to be produced in churches. I'll, I'll read a couple of passages here. This is uh, Trent, Council of Trent on art. <clears throat> Quote, By means of the histories of the mysteries of our redemption, portrayed by paintings or other representations, the people is instructed and confirmed in the habit of remembering and continually, revolve, continually revolving in mind the articles of faith. As also that great prophet is derived from all sacred images, not only because the people are hereby admonished of the benefits and gifts bestowed upon them by, the, by Christ, but also because the miracles which God has performed by means of the saints and their salutary examples are set before the eyes of the faithful, that, that so they may give thanks, give God thanks for those things, may order their own lives and manners in imitation of the saints, and may be excited to adore and love God and to cultivate piety, unquote. One of the key words there, that passage I just read was, is be excited to adore and love God and to cultivate piety. They wanted art to be simple and to appeal to the emotions so it moved the viewer. And so in uh, the wake of this uh, Council of Trent, artists began, you know, making religious art that way for churches. So it would be more obvious it was about religious subjects and about secular ones to avoid any sort of profane things in churches. Uh, and uh, and to uh, make sure it elicited, you know, religious feelings, if you want to put it that way, in the minds of uh, minds of believers. Uh, and that is the main purpose. That's one of the main purposes, purposes, purposes that the church uh, had, the church fathers of the Council of Trent had with regard to the liturgy. Um, Council of Trent was, uh, in these matters about liturgy, was less concerned than with the liturgy itself than with doctrinal matters, uh, in particular, the need to defend the church's teaching against Protestant views. So doctrines like the real presence, the sacrifice of the mass, are, are supposed to get good, uh, supposed to get attention from pastors. And it actually enjoins uh, pastors to talk about this stuff in the mass. This is also from one of the sessions of the Council of Trent. <clears throat> Here I'm quoting again, quote, The Holy Synod commands pastors and everyone who has the care of souls to explain frequently during the celebration of the masses, either themselves or through others, some of the things which are read in the Mass, and among other things, to expound some mystery of this most holy sacrifice, especially on Sundays and feast days, unquote. And so, uh, the Council of Trent um, um, basically uh, enjoined the Church to uh, reform the liturgy, and so after the Council was over, uh, a, a commission was created by the Pope, who revised that revised the text of the liturgy in, in a place at the time. Again, sometimes you get this idea that the Council of Trent itself created a new liturgy out of whole cloth. It didn't. It just rev revised the existing liturgical books. Uh, with those with those things in mind, that's where you get this art of the Baroque from. You get this um, you get this art which is um, very much meant to appeal to to the senses, to get to the spirit through the senses, put it that way, and to grab people. Um, and uh, as you're going to see, if you've ever seen a Baroque high altar, they can be really, <clears throat> I'm choosing my words carefully, gaudy. <laughs> They're overwhelming in their, if you see pictures of it, you can Google this. Go Google Baroque, Google Baroque high altar and see what images come up. Uh, massive, massive altars where you have ray, you know, rays of sunlight beams basically in gold uh, projecting outward from the altar. Uh, again, the idea is to emphasize the sacrificial character of the Mass, the fact that God really is present uh, in the Eucharist. Um, and I, so I guess the thinking was, you can't make it gaudy enough. <laughs> and so you make it as gaudy as you possibly can. And it's meant to have an effect on you. That's the other thing about uh, this religious art of the Baroque, it's meant to enjoin feeling and emotion. And again, sometimes this isn't always, this can be kind of crude or a little bit uh, bizarre. The term that's sometimes used of, to refer to the Baroque is exuberant, being exuberant, expressing passion, inviting passion, and giving an idea of what kind of effect it could have on people, this type of liturgy. Because one thing to remember here is the liturgy didn't change much at all between the Council of Trent and the Second Vatican Council. It stayed really the same. It was much more uniform. It stayed uniform for a long time. <clears throat> but so to give you an idea of how this <clears throat> how this could affect someone who was not Catholic, 
Um, if you don't know who John Adams is, he's the second president of the United States, one of the founding fathers of the United States. During the um, run-up to the American Revolution in the 1770s, John Adams is a, a Puritan, a Calvinist by background, is from uh, Massachusetts in New England, and he traveled to the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, for the first Continental Congress. This was a meeting of the uh, representatives from the American colonies who were meeting together to respond to the problems they were having with the government back in Britain. John Adams had never been outside of Massachusetts before he went to uh, Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, they had a small Catholic community. So while he was there, he went with some colleagues, uh, George Washington and others, to the local Catholic church. And he wrote about this in his diary and in a letter to his wife, Abigail. I want to read this selection from his letter to his wife. Fascinating. Uh, it's from October 17, 1774. Uh, quote, this afternoon, led by curiosity and good company, I strolled away to Mother Church, or rather Grandmother Church, I mean the Romish chapel, heard a good short moral essay, moral essay upon the duty of parents to their children, founded in justice and charity, to take care of their interests, temporal and spiritual. <clears throat> this afternoon's entertainment was to me most awful and affecting, just to, as an aside, when he says awful, it doesn't mean bad. He means full of awe. And affecting means that it was emotional and everything. He goes on. The poor wretches, fingering their beans, chanting Latin, not a word of which they understood, their paternosters and ave marias, their holy water, they're crossing themselves perpetually, they're bowing to the name of Jesus, they're wherever they hear it, they're bowings and kneelings and genuflections before the altar. The dress of the priest was rich with lace. His pulpit was velvet and gold. The altarpiece was very rich. Little images and crucifixes about. Wax candles lighted up. But how shall I describe the picture of our Savior in a frame of marble over the altar at full length upon the cross, in the agonies, in the blood dropping and streaming from his wounds? The music consisting of an organ and a choir of singers went all the afternoon, excepting sermon time, and the assembly chanted, most sweetly and exquisitely. Here is everything which can lay hold of the sight, eye, ear, and imagination. Everything which can charm and bewitch the simple and ignorant. I wonder how Luther ever broke the spell." Unquote. And here you have a good, uh, a good sort of summation of everything that critics of this, uh, uh, Protestant critics had of this. I mean, remember, Calvinists as we'll discuss in a moment, uh, have no use for images in their churches whatsoever. You wouldn't find any any images whatsoever except for maybe the Bible or the Ten Commandments in a colonial New England church. And again, the criticisms are obvious. These people don't know Latin, so they don't know exactly what's going on, what the priest is saying. They're bowing all the time. They're prostrating themselves. They're crossing themselves. All these, what seem like to the Puritan, excessive external gestures. The picture of the Savior, blood dripping, again, the actual, you know, uh, the actual depiction of Christ suffering on the cross. Uh, and and uh, all of this is sort of like shock and awe for the soul. And, of course, he has negative things to say about it. And I know some Catholics find this, you know, kind of insulting. But, and you don't have to take everything he says as being true. But it's the idea is these people don't know what they're worshiping, all this other stuff. However, you should, this should not let you um, ignore what is the obvious subtext of that, of, of his little letter there. He's obviously fascinated by this. <laughs> He's kind of into it. Uh, and I say that because that's the power of that liturgy. It can draw you in if, if you let it. And it was meant to have that effect. Now, what happens is, of course, this starts out as church art, but very quickly, from the end of the 16th, beginning of the 17th centuries, a lot of the techniques and a lot of the um, the the sort of um, uh, yeah techniques, but also the the drive to induce emotion in the viewer, uh, the drive to you know um, uh, uh, do those things which have been joined by the Council of Trent, move very quickly into secular art, translated into secular, transferred to secular art in places like Spain. And Italy first. It'll eventually broaden out to other countries, uh, and France and everything. And it's it. Uh, this will come about in works of people like um, 
uh, Caravaggio, uh, the great, um, the great artist of the uh, of the immediate, uh, yeah, uh, immediate beginnings of the of the Baroque. Um, Michelangelo Marizzi de, Ca de Caravaggio, <clears throat> the great Caravaggio. He, uh, if you don't know, I, I live in the, told you I live in the Kansas City area, in a local mu art museum here, the, Mel the Nelson Atkins Museum. We have a Caravaggio. We have a John the Baptist, and his John the Baptist is amazing. Um, up to that time, traditionally, John the Baptist has been depicted as an old guy. He's usually this sort of old figure, an Old Testament prophet. And Caravaggio makes him totally, makes him young. Uh, and has him sort of seated in this, uh, you have to see it, go Google it. Uh, he's seated uh, with, a, with a staff, and he's kind of half covered by his, um, whatever, his uh, robe or whatever. And you see, like, parts of him are in light, parts of him in darkness. That was uh, Caravaggio's big thing, is the use of dark uh, shadow and light. It's called tenebrism in art. Um, but it's a wonderful image of, okay, what they, what you do. It's almost like, if you see the painting, you visualize the painting, it's like John the Baptist as James Dean. It's like this moody, very, you know, almost anti-hero John the Baptist. is really cool. And this is the kind of thing that gets into secular art. And so you have this idea of drawing people in, um, using techniques to manipulate emotions and stuff like this, becoming widespread in lots of different uh, areas of, arc of art, architecture, painting, music. Um, the early 17th century is the age when opera is born, for example, in Italy. Um, uh, Claudio Monteverdi is usually one of the people uh, responsible for this. Uh, there is nothing more Baroque in some ways than opera. Uh, it's very, very irregular. It's very, yeah. When I think of when I think of something like that, I think of, I think definitely think of, uh, of uh, of opera, and so it'll become popular throughout Europe, and it will spread very quickly into uh, other countries, not just in a um, not just in a secular sense, but also a religious sense. And pretty much everywhere uh, by the latter part of the 17th century, not just in Catholic countries, but also in Protestant ones. Uh, you will have, for example, uh, not in the Calvinist world, if you don't, uh, Calvinist is different, but in Lutheran countries, uh, in Scandinavia, for example, uh, there's a beautiful uh, cathedral in Sweden, uh, Kalmar Cathedral, which is a Baroque, so this pink exterior and this kind of, you know, copper orange roof. Really lovely. There's uh, a church in Copenhagen in Denmark. I think it's called Church of Our Saviors, Lutheran Church. It's this beautiful, um, you know, gold-plated spire outside uh, in the uh, exterior, and other places as well. Gets into the Orthodox world um, in places like Russia. Peter the Great, uh, the Tsar, who uh, goes to visit Western Europe in the late 16th, uh, late 17th century, tries to modernize Russia, especially its military, um, through Western techniques. When he builds his city on the Baltic Sea, St. Petersburg, uh, he'll build it, uh, the buildings in a sort of Baroque style. And these will be different, by the way. They'll be less, it begins this very ecstatic, you know, um, type of artwork, type of uh, architecture in, in uh, Catholic countries. It'll be a little more strained in the Protestant and in the Orthodox world. Uh, but lots of color, stuff like that. Uh, gets into, you know, places like the Ukraine. There's actually a style of church architecture. If you don't know, the Ukraine was actually governed uh, at, at one point by, well, two points by Poland, then Austria in um, the 17th and 18th century. So it had that influence. It's called uh, Ukrainian Baroque or sometimes called Cossack Baroque. Cossacks were the sort of, you know, uh, quasi, I don't want to say nomadic, but they're the type of that sort of borderland peoples who were part of the Ukraine. Uh, and so Cossack Baroque is a, a name given to it. I like the name, actually. I ever start a garage band or a grunge band, I'll call it Cossack Baroque. It'd be kind of a good name for a band that way. But uh, point is, it crosses borders and boundaries. Even makes it way makes its way uh, to other continents, particularly, of course, Latin America, where both in uh, Spanish and Portuguese controlled territories, you can find beautiful examples of Baroque architecture and Baroque music. I should say um, Baroque. Uh, you know, uh, I would say Baroque music, I, again, we'll get to this in a moment, but um, there's a style of, you know, um, church music, which is kind of, you know, modern church music begins with this. I admit I'm not as big a fan of, of Baroque music in, uh, in a sacred setting, but do like things like uh, a, ba a Bach and other types of uh, composers of that era. So, but it, it spreads throughout throughout Europe and the, even into Asia where, you know, again, churches are built um, 
in places under Portuguese uh, rule. Even, by the way, we'll make, we'll, we'll, uh, there would even be people building, of all things, synagogues in a Baroque style in certain places in Europe. Definitely would be, there are definitely Baroque composers. Uh, one of them is pretty famous, a guy named Salomone Rossi, Italian, who composed Baroque music for the synagogue. Can you imagine? This is a Christian art form being used in, in Jewish synagogues. So it, it, it had a wide, wide birth. Now, this may sound all great and good. What's the problem with the Baroque? I remember I started talking about how this had something to do with recovation in our own day. This goes back to another thing that's happening in the 17th century. In the 17th century, of course, you have... We have had the fallout from the Protestant Reformation, in which, of course, there have been religious wars, there have been challenges to political and religious authority. And so what's happening in response to all this politically is the growth of absolute monarchies. Um, you know, uh, monarchs who are trying to take control of their countries, eliminate, you know, competitors for sovereignty in their countries. Above all, of course, we associate this with countries like Spain and, and, um, and above all, France, with the France of Louis XIV, Louis XIV, in his court at Versailles, it reaches, of course, there, there are, you know, um, absolute monarchies in places like Russia. Sweden is an absolute monarchy uh, for a good, t a good bit uh, in the 17th century as well. Uh, but it is in those societies, at these courts, where this art sort of reaches in some ways its apogee in a secular sense. And in fact, there's the there's a there's a thesis years ago by an historian named Antonio Maraval that Baroque culture, once it uh, leaves its Catholic confines, becomes a sort of pan-European culture, which is a response to what he calls a general crisis of European society. This crisis of authority, this effort to sort of put back social life after the destruction of the Thirty Years' War and stuff like this. And in fact, in this in this era, absolute monarchs were seen as, you know, the mechanism in order to, to not just restore order, but also to help improve society. A lot of people were afraid of uh, disorder from below, riots and rebellions, especially in cities. Urban areas were thought to be, and were, um, seedbeds of rebellion in the 17th century. And so you had these royal courts with, you know, not just the kings, but also nobility and uh, bourgeois patrons. They helped create a what he Marvel called a guided culture, quote unquote, of spectacle and novelty um, that would channel people's desires into pursuits that were apolitical and not established order. And so this is where people usually talk about um, again Louis Catars, the great, uh, the Sun King, right? That great symbolism. I'm the the sun which gives light to France. It, you know, uh, the monarch becomes a matter of display for his subjects. In these absolute monarchies. And if you've ever seen, you can Google this as well, early in his reign, Louis XIV, he used to hold these magnificent, you know, banquets or whatever, balls for his, for his, um, for his nobility at his, his uh, palace at Versailles, right? He built this Versailles to be so this, it was this place where the monarchy of France would be on display for the people. And um, the pictures of him dressed up in an outfit uh, meant to display him as Apollo, the god Apollo. And it has, of course, suns all over the outfit. It's really gaudy. It's really, it's really weird looking. It's very Baroque, in other words. And in fact, if you think about it, just think about, you know, if you ever wondered why, what's the purpose of fashion shows? Of, of, you know, emaciated young women wearing these ugly, bizarre outfits. Well, it's partly to distinguish you from, <laughs> from the hoi polloi, from the common people, but also to display, to show, to make yourself a spectacle, to dazzle people, uh, to astound them with your, you know, these inventions. This is something that happens, by the way, all throughout Europe. Um, the Baroque, as a broader cultural art form, loves this stuff. Um, it loves not just, it loves things, if you look at, I don't have time to show you the paintings and everything, but one of the things that Baroque paintings love are things that are optical illusions. Um, there's a famous Jesuit church in Rome, uh, which, in which the ceiling is painted, it's a flat ceiling, it's painted as, as if it has a dome, but it doesn't. Uh, and they love that sort of stuff, uh, optical illusions, they loved, um, 
entertainments, which were, which, you know, for example, 17th century theater in places like France and England and elsewhere was famous for using uh, elaborate machines. Um, in England, they actually had this sometimes called the uh, machine plays um, because you have things, you know, movable scenery, dance numbers, music, um, these Baroque, you know, illusionist type paintings, costumes, trap doors, quote unquote, flying actors that fly in on, you know, on cables or whatever, fireworks. Um, again, they love spectacle. This is a culture of spectacle. And, and so, and this is what in some ways uh, comes, you know, to be typical of the Baroque in that more secular sense. And that's an important thing to, uh, to keep in mind here. So, again, that's great. What does all that have to do with us, to come back to that, that point there? Well, uh, the fact of the matter is, you're going to have, in, um, in the 20th century, you're going to have liturgical reformers in the first part of the 20th century, uh, who, um, the first, uh, who do the first academic work on the history of the liturgy, going back to the early centuries of the church up to the, you know, or 20th century, who begin to sort of idealize the early centuries of the church, and they they begin to see later periods of growth of the liturgy, again, late Middle Ages, into the Renaissance and the Baroque, as periods of corruption that fell away from, you know, the simple ideas of, the simpler liturgies, I guess, of an earlier period, the purity of the early church. This is a common thing in Catholic theology, going back to its beginnings to recover the purity of the early church. And uh, especially you begin to get this idea that Baroque manifestations, in particular the, the, the liturgy that we associate with the Council of Trent, colloquially called the Tridentine Liturgy, was a result of court culture in the 16th and 17th centuries. And in particular, one there are several people who are very influential in all this, but one of the most influential people who spread this idea was a theologian named Louis Boyer. Father Boyer was a uh, convert from Lutheranism in uh, the 1920s. And 1950s, he wrote an influential book called Liturgical Piety. And he thought that he hated the Baroque. <laughs> he thought it was excessively dramatic in its music, overly, you know, uh, overly ceremonial, you know, too much emphasis on external gestures and ritual and stuff like this, and too too rigid in its form. This, I'll read passage here from where he talks about this. This is what he says about uh, the liturgy of that period. Quote, it is from the 16th and 17th century idea of court life that Catholics derived their false notions of public worship. An earthly king must be honored daily by the pageant of court ceremonial, and so also the heavenly king. The courtly atmosphere around him was to be provided by the liturgy. The liturgy, as many handbooks of the period actually say, was to be considered, quote, the, better the etiquette of the great king, unquote. Uh, and so, again, he popularized this idea that the reason why the liturgy was the way it was was not uh, for religious purposes, but because it was drawing on secular ideas of court ceremonial, the grandeur and the pomp, and the desire to display yourself to the common people in order, order to sort of overawe them. Again, the whole idea is that um, the liturgy is there to sort of overawe ordinary lay folk. In other words, they don't know what's going on. They, uh, they're made dumb by the spectacle. They're just, they're just mindless spectators. Uh, and he sees this as, as a distortion of the liturgy. And he, he identifies three, three uh, reasons why it happened. He identifies, first of all, the sort of you know, revival of, of a pagan, um, of, of classical uh, aesthetics associated with the pagan world of, of, you know, Greek and Roman antiquity in the Renaissance to the detriment of biblical imagery. He also said that there was a, what he called a violent hunger for the superhuman instead of the, uh, the supernatural. Uh, other words, an emphasis, again, on spectacle, on bigness, rather than, you know, the spirit. I mean, too much emphasis on the visible, I guess, is the way to put it. And then finally, he said something else is that this, what he calls Baroque Catholicism, was basically amounted to a, a, a sort of putting loyalty to the church above all else, which he said was, quote, not genuinely, genuinely Christian. Uh, again, this is kind of a, a, it's kind of a shocking charge to make to a certain degree. And he also charged that the Baroque era basically, um, 
froze the mass of amber, didn't allow it to develop. Um, he said that, quote, it's rigid and unintelligent traditionalism was the providential means whereby the church managed to keep her liturgical treasure safe throughout a long period when scarcely anyone uh, was capable of understanding their true worth, unquote. As you can kind of tell, uh, boy, I didn't like the Baroque that much. And I have to say, when I first when I first encountered this art form in architecture and music, I didn't like it either. Now, having said all that, one of the things we actually do have a better grasp on now is that this is an overwrought picture of the Baroque. <clears throat> in fact, um, uh, it's not the case that the reform of the Council of Trent and the courts and the um, um, the Baroque, you know, architecture and liturgical style of the period was derived from secular sources. It's not true. In fact, um, the Fathers of Trent, the commission that was set up to, to um, carry out its, um, its strictures on the liturgy, investigated uh, the, uh, the ancient sources they had, um, they had available to them. They didn't know as much as we do in the 20th century. That's why some liturgical reformers like Father Boyer were so dismissive of them. But they did what they, they, did what they could. The commission that Trent set up, actually, or was sent up after Trent, actually used Greek as well as Latin fathers of the church to uh, to study, you know, early Christian sources. They did prune and remove things from the uh, the uh, the missal that had grown up in the late Middle Ages, to try to make it simple so people could understand things better. Um, it encouraged the printing of prayer books, people so people follow mass. There was a real effort to get people to understand things, and again. In every age, you're people, going people at Mass who don't, aren't paying attention don't know what's going on. <laughs> I don't think you can blame everything on this. Um, in other words, it's, it's you know, it, it is basically um, not as unthinking and, un, and stilted and awful as Father Boyer made it uh, sound uh, in many respects. So, again, come back again. Oh, uh, what does that have to do with recovation? Well, you had these th this thought about the Baroque being applied to the church's liturgy. And so it was seen to be, the, the forms of it were seen to be a product of their time, his therefore historically relative. Like Again, it's supposed to come from this court culture, this secular court culture, so we can get rid of it now. And it was even a certain... Uh, certain um, um, senses uh, thought to be opposed to Christianity, right? To, it was, you know, uh, it made, it, it uh, discouraged active participation in the liturgy by the laity. Uh, it made them dumb spectators. You hear this a lot. It made them into dumb, mute spectators who didn't know anything and weren't doing anything. You hear these criticisms a lot, but this is drawing on this criticism of the Baroque. This is where, by the way, you get, uh, if you ever wondered why uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the devotion of adoration, Eucharistic adoration, nearly died after the Second Vatican Council in many places. This is one of the reasons. Uh, it was sometimes said that the, uh, this, this, you know, veneration of the Eucharistic ho host was like the veneration of a monarch or something. And so there's this, I think, mistaken identification of, uh, of, of, um, of, of this certain liturgical style in the church's history with secular culture, but even with a particular political form, of course, which is the the absolute monarchy. And of course, in the 1960s, this is the age of, you know, social revolution, upheaval. People wanted nothing to do with, uh, you know, they wanted to democratize everything, democratize the church, democratize culture. So this all looked bad to people. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons. There are many others that people wanted to throw things out, but there is, it goes back to this this view of the Baroque, which uh, I'll say it again, um, it's not it's not my favorite style of, of church architecture, art, painting. I, it's not my favorite, you know, era of liturgical history. I didn't prefer, I tend to idealize the ancient world, the medieval world, the Gothic, those sorts of things. But one of the things in my own journey into the faith, I've, you know, I've, I, I, you know, when I, I, I'm, if you don't know my backstory, I'm a convert. I converted while I was in graduate school nearly 20 years ago, and I read my way into the church, and the thing that really touched my imagination was, you know, late antiquity, the church as it, you know, emerged after Constantine, the late Roman Empire, the Middle Ages, you know, those sorts of things really fired my imagination. I confess, I never really found its history very interesting after the Reformation. It kind of seemed like a decline in some ways to me. And yet, I have... 
um, I have, um, you know, learned to love and appreciate uh, the church's heritage after after that uh, I, I, in the journey of my own life and the faith to learn to appreciate the saints of the post-Reformation period, for example. I think this would apply to the Baroque. It's not perfect. It, it, again, I don't like every expression of it, and I think the other ones are better, but it, it's, it can be very lovely, it can be moving. It's definitely part of the Catholic heritage. And one of the things I, I think this is a problem coming out of the 1960s was people were so... They saw that there were problems in the church and problems with liturgy. They wanted to reform it so badly, they, they came to see... What they, reme what they had received from their immediate predecessors as being somehow totally flawed. And that's never the case. Again, there are good things to take out of the, of, of the Baroque. Again, there's truth. There are some things that it obscures about the faith. But it can be a good thing, too. And so, uh, again, it's a, a kind of a key lesson there, I think. One other thing to note about the Baroque is, you know, it's, an, again, an ironic thing. You had these people, you know, recovating these churches... At the same time, because they thought they wanted to engage with contemporary culture, right? We're going to engage the modern world, engage culture. And they want the church to have influence on modern culture. Um, the documents of Vatican II talk about engaging the culture, culture this, culture that, evangelize the culture. Well, I'd have to say that the Baroque, again, look at the Baroque, this Catholic form of art, like touched all of Europe and other parts of the world. I mean, think about it. That's a much more successful engagement with the culture, quote-unquote, than anything that's been produced in the church since Vatican II. So it doesn't make sense to me to denigrate uh, this uh, this art form. So uh, you should learn to appreciate it, but you also learn to, you know, where you know, things kind of went off the rails in the uh, 1960s with, uh, I think, perhaps, and again, I actually love Father Boyer. It's a little too critical, uncharitable toward uh, the past of the church in many respects. In any case, that's my, uh, that's my summation about the, the Church in the Baroque. And if you like this podcast, I know I have some listeners out there. Uh, I'm going to ask you to do a favor for me. If you could uh, recommend my podcast to one friend, that's my challenge to you. Say, hey, this guy's got a good podcast. You'll like it. Um, you know, send them a, a message on Facebook, email. You can tweet at them on Twitter. Um, in fact, you can give them my – I have a Twitter account – uh, it's Controversies, Controversies H. Uh, you can include me in the tweet, so I can mention you next time if you share it. I mention you in the next episode. I uh, really appreciate it. Help spread the word. Trying to grow the podcast. Get it to more people. And so until next time, uh, everybody take care and God bless you.